now it looks full. All right, so how many of you guys remember the whole uh, Coney thing that went on a couple years ago with the children, slay, or the children uh, soldiers and stuff? And there was a lot of people like going around raising money for them. And it was a really bad deal, and, and it was good that you know, there was a lot of money being raised. Um, well, after kind of that craze, if you will, happened, um, I remember, I don't know if you guys heard, but I remember hearing about a couple different um, stories about people who had like made a bunch of money off of that. Like they basically faked um, supporting, you know, the whole Coney thing. And they went around and they even, some of these people were very elaborate with it and they even found people who were actually very passionate about, um, you know, that, that cause. And, and they had them go around and do, you know, you know demonstrations and, and, like, and speeches on, on what's going on and then they would sell shirts for, you know, $35, right? And, but people felt good about paying $35 for a shirt because you trust that the money is going to help, you know, end something that's bad, right? Um, and so I was really shocked to, to see that there was people that, you know, made a lot of money and never actually donated the money uh, that they were supposed to give towards ending um, the children's soldiers. And now that wasn't, the, that wasn't the majority of them at all or anything, but I just read a few stories about that. And it kind of made me think about how many hoaxes there are out there, right? Like, Nowadays, it seems like there's a lot of things that are, that are just that are fake. You know, you might be surfing through the internet, and you, you see something, and you're like, man, I got I to gotta fact check that, because who knows? It could be just totally made up. And as Christians, I think sometimes we put our hope, we put our trust in things that are false as well, right? And sometimes we need a kick in the butt, if you will, as a reality check to see if we're putting our hope and our faith or our confidence or our dependence in something that is false, somewhere that it's not supposed to be in. And so tonight we're going to look at a couple different hoaxes, if you will, that Christians can very easily fall into. Um, and so we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 29. Um, and and this, this particular passage here is part of a, a bigger section in the book of Romans. Um, the section is, is chapter 1 through chapter 3, verse 20. And this section, Paul is the entire time showing that all... Every, everybody, no matter who you are, is worthy and deserving of God's wrath. And, and, so, and, and he does this for the specific reason to say that everybody is deserving of God's wrath and that God is righteous in putting his wrath on humanity in order to then present the gospel. So he's showing the need for the gospel, and then he's going to show the gospel later. And so we'll kind of get into that. Um, but last week we heard about uh, Romans chapter 1. And so in Romans chapter 1, uh, Paul is talking about how the Gentiles are under God's wrath, are deserving of God's wrath. And so they're the people who don't know God, who don't know God's law, who don't have the scripture, right? And so it wasn't, it's not necessarily a super, super shocking thing to hear that, right? Okay, you know, the people who don't know God are are going to have God's wrath. Okay, you know, moving on, right? Not very shocking, not very tough to to hear or anything like that. But then in chapter 2, he starts to kind of switch gears. In chapter 2, he starts to talk about why the Jews, the Jewish moralists, are deserving of God's wrath as well. And so this can be a particularly kind of uncomfortable passage for us to look at because if us as a group had to be generalized as one or the other, like the Gentiles or Jews, um, we would definitely be categorized more on the side of the Jewish moralists. And um, we know that Paul is, is definitely talking to the Jews because he, he begins um, a literary style of debate called diatribe. And that's a really weird word, but basically what that is, is it's a, it's a Jewish style of debate in, in, lit, in literature, and um, it's where the debater puts an imagined um, question into the, uh, into the mouth of an imagined critic, only to then like pick that apart as he would like. And so because he, he moves into this, it's, very, it's pretty obvious that he's speaking to the Jews, and he also mentions the Jews. Um, but a lot of commentators also say that this is kind of applicable to, and he's also talking to, since it's written to Roman Christians, also to people who are not Jews but maybe live just a, a good life, live you know, a, a life with a higher set of morals. And so, um, so with that in mind, this can be a little bit of an uncomfortable passage as it seems to be more directed towards us than um, other passages. And so jumping into, this, uh, jumping into the passage here, we're going to look at our first point, and our first point is false confidence. And so we'll see, what that, we'll see what that means as we jump in here, but we'll start in verse 17. Chapter 2, verse 17. It says, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will 
and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law, for as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And so Paul here is addressing the fact that the Jews have a false confidence in something that they should not have confidence in. They have a false confidence in their knowledge of the law and in their knowledge of God and in their knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. And so Paul's main point here is that the morals have put and the Jews have put their confidence in this area where it shouldn't be. Um, and, and who better to know uh, the Jewish religious mindset than Paul, right? Paul was well beyond his years uh, in, in his, before he converted and became a Christian. He studied under um, one of the, the greatest uh, uh, rabbis of that time. And, and many commentators suggest that he was well on his way to becoming the next high priest of Israel. And so, before Paul's conversion, uh, Paul was a, a Jew of all Jews. I mean, he was, he was top-notch. And so, who better to, to, to know the, the religious mindset and, and the faults and the false confidence than Paul himself? And so, ultimately, what Paul centers on in this section is the Jews falsely putting their confidence in, the knowledge, uh, in their knowledge of the law. So, in verse 17, you'll see it says, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God... And know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. So they're boasting in the law. They're boasting in the fact that they know God as opposed to the opposite, opposed to the Gentiles who did not have the law, did not know God, did not necessarily know right from wrong. And so they're boasting in that. But then at the same time, look at verse 23, you who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. So Paul's kind of calling them out here. He's saying you boast in the law, but you don't. You don't do it, you don't follow it yourself. So they're being hypocritical, right? And now Paul isn't breaking down this, you know, years and years of Jewish mindset just because, you know, religion is bad or because, uh, you know, tradition is bad or anything like that. He's breaking it down and he's being very blunt for the specific purpose of breaking them down to where they realize and they are humbled to where they realize that they need the gospel, that they need grace. That their confidence in their eternal salvation cannot be in their knowledge of the law or their knowledge of God or their knowledge of morality, but it has to be in the gospel and in the grace that they are going to receive from Jesus Christ. And so it's interesting here that, that, uh, that Paul uh, brings this about because he also, he's kind of, he's not only talking about um, a false confidence, but he's also talking about just the law in general. Um, and it's interesting that he says this because he kind of, he kind of almost bashes these this years and years of, of ideology here. Um, but if we go back to, to Romans chapter 2, verse 13, just a little bit back, it says, For it is not hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but doers of the law who will be justified. And so this kind of goes along with, with the Jews boasting in their knowledge of the law, but they can't follow the law. So they boast in the law, but they can't follow it. But... They're also not going to be justified because they can't do it perfectly, right? And in Romans chapter 2, verse 6, going back a little bit, remember this is just all one section here, it says, He will render to each one according to his works, but no one can uphold the law. Skipping ahead, Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, No one is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And so Paul is trying to just, just bang home this, this, the ideology that, that confidence in the law is worthless. Confidence in their knowledge of the law is worthless. And then on top of that, he's saying, you know, you can't keep the law, but you're not fooling God, right? You know, God knows that you can't keep the law perfectly, but you're not... You're not uh, you're not fooling anybody else as well, because verse 24 in chapter 2 says, For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. 
And I think that that's kind of interesting because um, if, you, if you ask people who are not Christians what some of their biggest you know, beef with Christianity is, um, a lot of times I think one of, the, one of the top things you'll see up there, and probably if you ask Christians the same thing, the same question, the same answer would be, but they'll say, you know, they're hypocrites, right? You know, you teach the law, you, you, you know the law, you teach the law, but then you don't follow the law, right? And so in the same way, I have to wonder how similar are we to the Jewish moralists of Paul's day? How much of our confidence is in, our, in our eternal salvation is based upon our knowledge of the Bible? How much of our confidence is based on our knowledge of God? Simply the fact that we know the Bible, right? We have spiritual disciplines. We read the Bible, right? We can, we can recite the Bible, we know what's right and wrong. We know what God wants us to do and what he what doesn't want us to do. But how much of our confidence in our eternal salvation is based upon just that? And that's not to bash any of these things at all. But if that's what we're placing our confidence for our salvation in, then it's hollow and it's empty. See, I, uh, I went fishing a lot this summer. Um, and Jack, actually, where's Jack? Oh, there you are. Jack stayed over the summer, and I guess all of his friends left him or something, and so he was bored, and so he came with me. Um, and we're friends, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and we, had a, we had a pretty big argument one day um, out on the river, and we didn't have access to phones or anything, and so we couldn't prove who was right and who was wrong for, like, quite a while. He did win. <laughs> Humility. Um, and so we had our argument was about who produced uh, Finding Nemo. And, yeah, he did win. And I said it was, I said it was Disney, right? I said, yeah. I said it was Disney. He said it was Pixar. And, and, you know, and then so then naturally, like, as we began debating why and why not, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty firm in my stance that it's Disney. And based on the, your guys' groans, I can tell that all of you know it's clearly not Disney. Um, and I don't know why I thought that, but I, you know, but I stood strong and I, and I said that it was Disney and I ended up owing him a Dr. Pepper afterwards as soon as we had internet access, um, actually two Dr. Peppers because our bets got bigger and bigger because I thought I was right. Um, <laughs> but talk about false confidence, right? I had very much false confidence that Finding Nemo was made by Disney, um, but the interesting thing about this story is that if I'm completely honest with myself, this will be the first time I tell this to Jack, um, only about 50% of me holding on to this was my perceived knowledge of Disney and Pixar movies, right? Um, the other 50% really was because of my pride. You know, I said it was Disney, it's going to be Disney, right? And, and I'm going to hold on to that till I'm very much proven wrong. And, and honestly, I think if we're if we're honest as well in our Christian lives, a big part of the reason that we falsely place our confidence in our knowledge of the scripture or our confidence in simply our knowledge of God or our confidence for our eternal salvation in other hollow things is because of our pride. We want to feel just like the Jews, maybe they felt a little bit self-righteous. They felt a little bit a little bit above everybody else because they had the scripture, because, because they knew God. And it'd be safe to say that we fall into the same thing, don't we? It's very easy for us to look down on others who, who don't have the Bible or who don't read the Bible or who don't know God and for us to think of ourselves as holier than thou, right? Or more worthy than they are. And I think a lot of times it's our pride and even on an opposite spectrum, sometimes we feel like we can make it up to God, right? We don't like to feel completely helpless. We don't like to be completely humbled before God. We like to think that if we know enough about God, if we know enough about his scriptures, if we know enough about his law, that we can prove it to God and that that will be enough and that somehow we can do something to make it on our own. See, my friends, our confidence has to be placed on what Christ has accomplished. His perfect life, his death on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection. And that's what provides the atonement for our sins. That's what provides the sacrifice for our sins. Because we cannot make it on our own. 
We need grace. And that's the point that Paul is getting across here, even though he's being so blunt with the Jews, even though he's tearing down so much of what they've held on to for so long. And he's, he's tearing it down so bluntly because he has to get through to them that they can't do it on their own. That they need God's grace just as much as the unrighteous Gentiles, just as much as the people who don't know God. Because they're all in the same boat. The second, the second section here is, is kind of our second point, is false dependence. False dependence. Um, so we're going to go ahead and read Romans chapter 2, verses 25 through 29. Finish off the section here. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the spirit, not by the letter, his praise is not from man, but from God. Big words there, a lot of the same word. Um, and so our second point for tonight is false dependence. And in this section, Paul kind of comes at the Jews from a different angle, comes at the moralists from a different angle, and, and, and he's coming at them from the angle and trying to break down this, this belief that their standing with God was secure because of the sign of circumcision that they had. And, and Paul says that the external sign of circumcision here is, has no value apart from obedience. And this kind of follows along with, with the entire theme of this passage is, is kind of obedience and, that, and with the law. And if, if you're obedient to the law, then, then perfectly, then justification can come through the law. But if you are not obedient to the law, then you're judged by the law if you know the law. And so it's kind of this catch-22. He's, he's, he's finding them here, or finding them in here. And it kind of goes back to uh, Romans uh, 1.17 where he quotes Habakkuk 2.4 and he says, As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And so what he's saying in verse 25, For circumcision indeed is of no value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So what he's saying is that circumcision has no value apart from obedience. In fact, if, if you think about the first person who was given the sign of circumcision was Abraham, Right? Now, what did Abraham do? God told him to go off into unknown lands, right? Told him to do these things, and, and he went in faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And he went by faith in obedience, right? So he was given the sign of circumcision, but it was paired with obedience. And so Paul is saying, is kind of bringing it back to that, and he's saying, no, this, apart from obedience, this means nothing for you guys. And then in verses 26 and 27, I'm just kind of breaking it down because he kind of goes back and forth so much. It's kind of, when you read through, it's kind of hard to figure out exactly what he's saying. So I'm trying to break it down because um, it's hard for me to understand at least. Um, and so in verses 26 and 27, he's saying that circumcision is worthless compared to obedience. And he drives the point home by saying that someone who is uncircumcised but obedient to God's law is more circumcised than someone who is circumcised but isn't, obe but isn't obedient. So I know that's a mouthful and it's kind of back and forth. Um, but we have to realize that what Paul is doing here is very, very countercultural um, to, to Judaism. Um, what he's saying here could very possibly uh, get him killed by the religious sect. I mean, he's breaking down a lot of years of, of, of cultural significance and, and tradition and, and all of these different things, right? Um, he, this is a big deal what he's saying. And it's a big deal for a reason. Because circumcision was, was the seal of the believer, from the New Testament up until uh, this point. And the reason Paul has to be so blunt is because um, a Jew in the contemporary day would appeal to his sign of circumcision as a, almost a membership badge to the fact that he's in God's, in, as a member of God's people. And so Paul is trying to say that, that even that lawbreakers are uncircumcised and, and then ob people who are obedient are circumcised. And so he kind of he breaks it down a little bit here and showing that apart from obedience, circumcision means nothing. And he's kind of explaining the difference between a false Jew and a true Jew. 
And a false Jew would be characterized by outward physical circumcision according to the written code and receiving praise from men. And then a true Jew would be characterized by inward circumcision of the heart, as you can see in, in verse 29, it says, by uh, a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And then receiving praise from God, not from man. And so this is a little tough to bring into um, some modern day cultural significance. But one thing is uh, that I kind of thought of is, is how would we characterize um, a true Christian and maybe a false Christian? Kind of similar to this. A false Christian may have a false dependence on things that, are, that he, shouldn't, he or she should not be dependent on, right? And so a false Christian may have, have a religious claim to Christianity or a hollow knowledge of morality, right? Receiving praise from man. And then a true Christian might have an inward change of heart, a dependence on grace, a humility before God, a re realization of our own depravity, right? And a full dependence on grace, Receiving not praise from men, necessarily, but praise from God. And so, in short, Paul's explanation is that the moralists and the Jews have no excuse to, to get away from God's wrath because, because of their dependence on an outward sign, rather than on an inward devotion to God. And so, they are facing the wrath of God and are in the same boat as the unrighteous Gentiles. And so, um, I want you guys to think of a a boat, like a big ancient ship. And so if any of you know about big old ancient ships, forgive me, I don't. This is just my, uh, my story that I'm making up. Um, and so a big ancient ship. And so you have some people that are working really hard on this ship to make sure that it's, it's going where it's supposed to go, staying on course, you know, doing all these things, right? Maybe you have some like people who are rowing, like a lot of rowers or something. Like I'm picturing like a Viking warship or something. Um, but it's kind of a hybrid because there's nobility too. Um, and so you got people that are rowing, you got some deck hands that are staying up all night, you know, pulling ropes around, Pirates of the Caribbean style. Like they're doing a lot of work. They're, they're grimy and they're, they're dirty and, and they're just working hard, right? So you got people who are working really hard to make sure the ship's going where it's supposed to go. And then you've got some nobility or some like royalty people, maybe some supervisors who are just kind of throwing off all their work on, on the littler people and, and telling them to, what to do and then they're not really doing anything. We got some nobility that are walking around, and they're, they're just enjoying everything that the ship has to offer, right? They're enjoying the weather and, and the ocean breeze and, you know, the smells and whatever, whatever you enjoy on an ocean, ancient ocean boat. I don't know. But they're having a good time. They're enjoying everything it has, it has to offer, right? Now, suddenly, a big, a big hole is knocked in the ship, Titanic style. No life rafts. In one single instant, right, everybody on that ship has one thing in common. What's that? They're all drowning. There we go. They're all going to drown. And so it doesn't really matter if you were one of the people who rode, you know, for days on end, right, and you worked really, really hard to make sure this ship was going on course. It doesn't really matter because you're going to drown just the same way as the people who enjoyed the ship and didn't really do much to make sure it didn't hit the imaginary ice cube or whatever. Because everybody's on the same boat. Everybody is going to drown, right? <laughs> and I think that this is kind of the big picture that Paul is trying to get across to the Jewish moralists here in this passage. He's trying to get across that it doesn't matter if, if you've worked really, really hard. It doesn't matter if, if you've lived a pretty good moral life. It doesn't matter if your, your knowledge uh, of the scriptures or your teaching of the scriptures. It, it doesn't matter if you have the outward sign of circumcision. Because all are deserving of God's wrath. Just the same as the unrighteous Gentiles. Those who did not have God's, God's law. Those who did not know God. All are still deserving of God's wrath. And that is the same thing is true for us today. We may work really hard... But sin knocked a big old, big old hole in our ship, and we're all going down together. You see, this is a really good place for us to be, not just once in our, um, in our journey as Christians through life, but, but m really many times, is to realize that we're all in the same boat. We all are deserving of God's wrath, and we all need a Savior. 
we all need grace. And that's what Paul's trying to get his audience to in this passage here today, is that, that we all need grace. And the only way that we can get grace is by taking our false dependence off of everything that we have it on that is not Christ. Our dependence and our confidence have to be on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the fact that he has died for our sins. And he has paid the price for our sins and that through him, I am the way, truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Through him, we can make it to eternal life. And he is the only one that we can put our confidence in and our dependence on. It's Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Lord, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the times that it encourages us. And we thank you for the times where it gives us a reality check. Lord, I pray that, that tonight might be a new turning point for a lot of us, that we might realize our own depravity, that we might realize that, that we've been putting too much hope and too much confidence and too much dependence on what we do and what we've accomplished and what we know. And Lord, I pray that that humility would make us turn to you in humility and thanksgiving. I pray that we would come to you as the giver of grace. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.